Gig Gab, the Working Musicians Podcast, episode 170 for Monday, June 18th, 2018. folks and welcome to gig gab the podcast that is by for and about working musicians here in durham new hampshire i'm dave hamilton and here in las gatas california back from beautiful alaska is paul kent that's fantastic man yeah i've never been to alaska anytime somebody mentions alaska i i can't help but be reminded of bob ross the uh the the <laughs> the, the, the late painter that used to be on tv all the time he couldn't stop yeah. talking about alaska but how was Alaska? It was pretty cool. I mean, we went on a cruise ship. We went with another couple good friends and we were celebrating something together. And, uh, you know, the cruise ship was fun. Yeah. The time with friends was awesome. The ports of call were really spectacular. I mean, it is it is just a different thing to see up there, how people live, these small, you know, even the even the big towns are small towns compared yeah. to down here. Right. And, uh, you know, it's just kind of fun to see how, no, no music in the ports that I saw. There were a couple of small bars that had some music. I don't know where the people came from, um, you know, where the musicians came from, obviously sure. locals, but, um, but I'll tell you one thing that on the boat, uh, this was a big cruise ship and on the boat, there was a, a branded BB Kings nightclub, you know, like there's BB Kings sure. blues clubs around. So there, there was, you know, they obviously licensed that. And, um, and there was a band playing R and B covers in there and they were so good. I mean, they were fantastic and they were doing all sorts of interesting things. Like they were taking these covers, they were, you know, adding really cool, funky hits to them, drawing them out, you know, not extended solos for the sake of solos, but, um, you know, r refrains and that type of thing. And I was struck and reminded that there's a level of professionalism and a level of talent that exists out there, uh, you know, in your own, you know, maybe if you live in New York City or Nashville or Austin or something like that, you know, the level of performing cover bands is, is comprised of, you know, off season touring pros or something, and you see something really remarkable. But I think in a lot of markets, it is weekend warriors that make up a large part of it. Sure. And, yeah, uh, right. That makes sense. Yeah. 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 And these guys, again, you know, I would guess they're, they're in their late twenties to early thirties. I was going to say um, that's the, again, that's the sweet spot there is not, not yet kids, probably not even married yet. That kind of range yeah. is make it. I mean, it's just difficult to go out on a cruise ship. Although I, I have a friend who, uh, who got married and and then went out uh, on the ship? I think for you know a six month tour or whatever it was, and um, but you know and and the marriage all worked out, which was good. But that's rare. Yeah, yeah. So so um, the interesting thing was, I talked to the guys on a break, and I was like, "Did you guys you know just apply as a band?" He goes, "No, no, we're just all individual musicians. So you just audition and send a tape or go to an audition, and then they put bands together, and they were playing like it was butter. And you know, it was kind of fun for me to kind of watch the eye." Uh, connections between them, you know, when they flub something, if they flub something mm -hmm. and how they recovered it, usually it was a smile, right? It was never, it was never a stress. The singers never turned around and, and you know, showed their hand, any of that type of stuff. Just, there was a quick glance, a knowing glance between musicians. And that's how they got through any kind of like flubs. And I don't think they'd be together terribly long. I'm not positive about that, but some of the things that they did just kind of led me to believe that they were kind of still finding their way through it. Got it. Through, I guess the way they, they sign up, you don't usually sign up for just a week. You usually sign up for, you know, a month or three months or something like that. Uh, yeah. It's usually a six, six month deal is, yeah. is the, the standard cruise ship thing. So, and, and not when I was doing cruises, I of course did the same thing that you're talking about where I, you know, catch the band on like a break or whatever and, and just wind up chit chatting. And a lot of times they try to, at least on the cruise lines that I was checking out, which was uh, Royal Caribbean and Disney, more RC when I was having these conversations with the bands, but Disney too. And, uh, and they would try to get it so that the band, like a new band joined all at once and did the same six month tour uh, so that they would tighten up real fast. Cause that, I, I don't know what it was like on your ship, but, these, the, you know, the, there would essentially be one, maybe two bands that would play 
everything for the entire cruise, right? Mm. So, and and it, I mean, maybe not the musicals or whatever; those would be different sometimes. But otherwise, you, you know, the the dance club at night, the pool party during the day, the kids thing, whatever it is, like they might have three gigs a day, you know, six days, five or six days a week. So they they tighten up pretty fast, right? <laughs> you know, when you're playing Absolutely. that often. It comes together really well, uh, really quickly. And then and then, like you said, yeah, you just kind of get that that, you know, that osmosis that things just kind of move around and you're good to go. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't see that. I only saw these guys playing that gig. I know what you're okay. talking about. Yeah. The things that I've done. Yep. But this seems to be their gig. And, you know, they played yeah. <laughs> three 45 minute sets, I think, four times over those seven days. Right. Yeah. And one thing that was funny is, you know, they got on stage and I think the keyboard player was probably technically the band leader. He had a clock on his keyboard set it for 45 minutes, point into the band. They, <laughs> they, I mean, they were done at 45 minutes, you know, s- s- straight on. It was really, it was actually kind of humorous, but they were so good. And like I said, they were just so effortless in being that good and, uh, and great entertainers, you know, really fun drummer was off the hook, entertaining groovalicious. I mean, it was really, it was just very fun for me to see people at that, that level, just doing that thing. Was they it were the so same, pro about it. Was it the same songs or at least the same genre of music, all, all four of those nights or were they no, was one night? It was the same eight, genres. Eight I mean, it was night or one night, uh, or, or how was it? I saw two thirds of a show one night and one third of a show the other okay. night. And there was a little bit of overlap. I know that the, the, when I saw the two thirds, I saw a first and second set and he came out and, um, he had the words to brown eyed girl that he put on his, uh, under his monitor, you know, and it was, so it was clearly, it was a request or something like that. And they just, you know, he was reading the words yeah. Two piece horn section. Uh, they were reading charts that were down on the floor, just using them as a, as a signpost. Um, the woman singer. So the, the makeup of the band was bass, guitar, drums, keys, a male lead singer, a female lead singer, and uh, two horns, a, a trumpet and a uh, and a saxophone player. Uh, and the woman, they were all fantastic. The woman singer, though, was like some cross between Tina Turner and Aretha Franklin. And wow. she was just on fire. I mean, just great energy, a fantastic soulful voice. And she uh, did, she said, this is a request. And so they, they clearly were taking requests and I don't know how big their library was to do that, but they did um, uh, simply the best by Tina Turner, I think was the, um, was the request. And that's, wow. that's not your standard request song, no, right? No, not at all. Yeah. Wow. So, yeah. And again, the, the, to, the thing to me was, that it's fun for me to be reminded about how good this, this art can be. I mean, you're seeing practitioners who are just really remarkable. And again, these guys are like the the three, the two singers and the one keyboard player was from Mississippi, rural Mississippi. They never, they didn't even know each other before they got on the boat. Right. And right. Uh, yeah, so it was just, um, it was just really fun to see people just be that good at doing that type of thing. Some of the songs are songs we do. And um, I got some cool ideas. I mean, they did Superstition. They added a cool refrain to the end. And uh, yeah, just that that understanding that there's a there's the even great weekend warrior band. Yeah. And then then there's the, you know, uh, I'm not touring right now, so I'll take casual work if it pays enough. And that's its own kind of genre. But this was like, you know, they're just musicians out to get a gig. Right. And they just got a pretty good one, six months of work or whatever it might be. And they were total pros about it. Like I said, no telegraphing of goofs, Um, uh, great focus on the audience. I mean, they were. Yeah, you need the whole thing. It's not just it's not just playing. You, You are performing every night, no matter what. Right. It's, well, you're evaluated on how well you're performing. Yeah, you're evaluated on how true. well the people like, you know, you want to keep that gig or get a chance to go on another gig. You better get some good reviews. And yep. um, and they earned it. And I, and I just it was thoroughly enjoyable, Dave. It was really awesome. cool to see great, 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 great players. Cool. I saw a couple of bands actually. And I played a gig last week, too, that, that I'll come back around to. But um, I saw two bands. One was uh, I saw the Dave Matthews band. They played near here uh, and we bought tickets. Actually, we bought tickets. 
back in January, I think. Before, they have a new record, right? They do, but um, they also have yet another lineup change, right? So uh. they had, I mean, they had, uh, you know, originally it was the five of them. Well, actually, originally it was six of them with a keyboard player, but that was in the really early days. And when they started touring, their keyboard player couldn't stay with them. So they dropped him or he dropped them or whatever it was. Uh, and then Leroy Moore passed away, you know, quite a while ago. And so yep. they, uh, and he played sax. And so they brought in Jeff Coffin on sax and, oh, Rashad, I can't remember Rashad's last name. The trumpet, the, the player. trumpet player. Exactly. Yeah. And, and I thought that worked, right? It, it filled it in. It, it still did the thing. And I mean, Dave on guitar. Dave's still on the acoustic. Oh, and then, and then Tim Reynolds, they Tim Reynolds on guitar. On electric guitar. That was, that was always kind of a difficult thing for me to to deal with sonically the the electric guitar cuz but Tim's Tim's tone is always really thin or at least in that band is really thin so it wasn't too thick it wasn't in the way I could sort of deal with it but it it definitely changed the songs right for sure but um but it you know that lineup worked and then recently of course Boyd Tinsley uh left the band um, oh, I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. So this I is the first tour without him, though, right? Yes. Uh, yeah. He left sort of by surprise. I mean, it was a by and surprise. And you know Boyd, right? I, 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 I do. I played on a record with him uh, years ago and hung out with him on and off through a mutual friend sort of at the same time. It was the mutual friend's record uh, friend, Brad Robinson. Uh, he and Boyd played together a bunch in Charlottesville before the Dave Matthews band took off or before the Dave Matthews band was even a thing. Uh, and then, uh, and then I played on Brad's record and Boyd played on that too, but there's a, there's a whole thing going on with Boyd. Uh, evidently he's had, uh, at least the, the accusations are that he's had some, uh, some interest in younger people for a long time that oh. has crossed the line. And, and and those stories have sort of been floating around for a while. For the record, I, I never experienced anything like this, you know, 20 years, 30 years ago, whatever, 25 years ago when I interacted with Boyd. But these stories have been floating around in, in various ways for a while. And then when he left the band, like the next day, somebody else filed suit against him, I think. So oh this, this was their way of saying, well, look, we arm's length, man. Like we can't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did they replace him? Well, so that was the thing. Because so many of those songs have those long <laughs> fiddle, solo, solos. fiddle solos. Yeah. So the original sort of word on the street was that it was going to be Robert Randolph um, replacing Boyd. And I thought, OK, that's cool. Like really hard to find. Uh, it, you know, when you're when when they lost their saxophone player, it's like, OK, you can find another saxophone player or in their case, two horns that sort of didn't replace one guy, but fills that sonic void. Right. And mm -hmm. uh, and I thought, OK, Robert Randolph, like that makes sense. It's a single solo instrument, unique. Right. Because he's playing that lap steel in his own way. Yeah. Like, OK, cool. Like you're not going to find another fiddle player that's going to fill that void the way Boyd did. Right. So best kind of a dead and company model. Right. Yeah, exactly. Right. But that didn't happen. Uh, they have uh, a guy named Buddy Stone playing organ with them and some piano. And it was it, it just muddied up the sound too much. So wait, wait, wait a second. So a, a song like Tripping Billy's where the fiddle was integral to the to the line of the song. You, you're saying it was just kind of like comped over with an organ part. You, you got it. Yeah. Well, Whoa. and 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 or, you know, Tim Reynolds would take a little lead or Jeff Coffin would play a little lead on sax. But they did. They played Tripping Billy's the night we saw him. And Lisa and I kind of looked at each other like, well, OK, <laughs> like this is interesting. But it, it really, you know, the thing is, like, that fiddle, the Dave Matthews band, when they started, Boyd was the star, right? Boyd had the Boyd Tinsley band in Charlottesville, and he was the one that had, you know, name recognition and, and some star power throughout uh, throughout Charlottesville. Uh, obviously, things changed. They were never meant to be called the Dave Matthews band. It was just that, that was a mistake that was listed on a venue somewhere, and they just stuck with it, obviously, and it worked out for them. But, um, but it, you know, they organized themselves as a band that happened to be playing all of Dave's tunes. Dave had kind of assembled uh, some of these people around. So the name was not wrong. It just was not intentional. And, uh, but Boyd was, the, Boyd was the star. And if you ever saw Boyd, 
on stage. I mean, his charisma, his smile could light up an arena. Absolutely. Big guy, big, big guy. bodybuilder guy. Yeah, right. The, right. The dreadlock. Right. You know, he's just such a presence, both both musically and just, you know, charisma and stage presence wise, that it was really, really weird. It, they felt, you know, my wife summed it up very well. She said they, uh, you know, they sound like a bar band now with a sax player, mm. you know, because the, the, with the organ and the electric guitar, it's like, OK, you've, you've now kind of homogenized yourselves and who knows? I mean, like this, no decision is the, the final decision, right? They could realize, oh, maybe let's try something different next tour. Or maybe Boyd will sort his crap out and they can bring him back. Like, who knows how that's all going to work? Mm. But yeah, it was it was not it was fine, but it wasn't it wasn't great. We've seen him much better uh, even even in recent years. So but there was one interesting thing I noticed, you know, so the three original members are Obviously, Dave Matthews, Carter Beaufort playing the drums and Stefan Lassard on bass, who when we started seeing him, I think Stefan was like 17 years old or something. Yeah. So he's now the same age as the rest of the guys were when the band started, because those guys were pretty <laughs> old. <laughs> um, and always has been a stellar bass player and was the perfect complement to Carter's like sort of busy, almost overplaying style. Right. Whereas he would just lay down those slippery grooves and really kind of keep things together and ground the show. And uh, and there was one tune that he started the other night and he started he, he played like a, 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 I don't know, a very short bass solo and then started the groove to the tune. But what I caught him doing is he he played his little solo or whatever, which which was fantastic. I mean, he you know, he's a good player. He's got a lot of dexterity. He's a really soulful kind of player. And then he stopped and he bounced on his feet for four counts to feel that groove, to get the tempo right. Mm. And then started the song. And it was like and I, you know, like we we've talked about this so many times here on the show that it was like. It was painfully obvious to me what was going on, but not painful in a bad way. It was like, oh, right. That's how you have to do it. You can't trust your brain to pull those tempos out because so many things can be different. You got to feel it in your body. And, and I remember the first time I learned that lesson was actually from a guy who learned it from Barry Tash and the, the, the guy from In the Remains. And uh, and this was Rick and the responders. He had played with Barry for a while. And he's like, no, nah, man, he's like, you can't just start the song. You've got to feel it in your body. Otherwise, you you, you know, chances are you're not going to get that tempo right. You have no way of knowing if you're really going to get the tempo right. And to see Stefan just take, you know, four counts. He wasn't, you know, he didn't feel like, I mean, there's, you know, whatever, 20,000 people in this place. Uh, and and he's like, nope, this is the right way to do this. I want the song to be good. So I don't want to start it in the wrong spot. So he just kind of settled in. He wasn't rushed, found the found the groove and then started playing the tune. And, and the rest of the band came in and it was it was great. You know, I mean, it, the groove was there. So it's just really interesting to see. Yeah, this is how pros are. And and, you know, you like there's some things that you just can't skip. And that's one of them is you got to find somewhere to feel that groove before you start the tune. So it's really it's always like a see. transcendent moment when you see the absolute pro of pro bands dealing with the same stuff we deal with in the littlest of clubs. Totally exactly the same thing. Right. And he had learned this lesson somewhere along the line and and continues to apply it. And and the song they played is one that I'm sure they've played, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of times. He probably would get the tempo pretty close if he just pulled it out of his head. But he knows not to trust his head because on any given night, might have had too much caffeine, might not have not had enough sleep, might be distracted by somebody in the front row. Like any of those things or the tempo for the last tune is still running in your head. Then you think, oh, yeah, that's the right. That's it. And then suddenly, you know, you're playing the song at light speed and, and it's like, oh, crap, you know. So, so you brought up the Dave Matthews band, which is a, a topic I think we have mentioned, Dave, several times over the couple of years. But. I think it's worth kind of diving in. I personally love Dave Matthews. There seems to be some shade that gets thrown at him, which I don't entirely understand. I think it goes something like he's made the same record six or seven times or, you know, his his stage persona, you know, turns some people off, or whatever it is. But I'll say, first of all, as a unique way to approach the acoustic guitar and rhythm guitar, he's incredible. He and plays that guitar the, like it's a drum. 
I, I mean, exactly. I, it's I, so rhythmic, and the oh, chord yeah. shapes are, are crazy. crazy. And then he sings over the over the rhythms, which is just un- freaking believable. To, to sing so, and play a song like Satellite, I just like crazy. I, I, yeah, it seems crazy to me. And I'm singing and playing with four limbs going at a time, and that seems crazy <laughs> to me. Like that's whole. That's next level stuff, man. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And you know, I just it's just such interesting music to me. It's so inventive. I, you know, I think personally, the drummer is the star of that band. Now, you know, you've covered Dave Matthews songs in the past. I, I have. I want to come back to your comment about Carter being the star of the band. Uh, but yes, I have covered Dave Matthews songs. Both. And do you do you study the jump parts and, and come close to it or do you just do what you need to do? Um, I, so I I used to go see the Dave Matthews band a lot. We had a really weird sort of uh, history with them. We saw them a ton in small clubs and then sort of medium sized clubs and then Basically, right around the moment that they started, they jumped to the arena level. We stopped seeing them for, I don't know, 15 years or something, right? What's the smallest place you saw them? Uh, tr- at the, a little frat party at Trinity College in, in Connecticut. Whoa. Oh, yeah, yeah. It was, but the first place I saw them was not small. I It was a totally random thing. I was visiting an ex-girlfriend in Colorado. She took me to Red Rocks. This was 1990. Two night, yeah, late ninety two, I think, and the samples were playing, and whoever was supposed to open for him got sick, and so the Dave Matthews Band was brought in because uh, they were playing the Fox Theater or something the night before. So I saw the Dave Matthews Band, and they were, I mean, uh, Dave had long hair, scared to death on that stage because that place holds like nine thousand people. <laughs> His guitar stopped wor- working during the first tune. <laughs> It was really funny, but they, as soon as they started playing, it was like, oh, holy crap. Like, what is this band? Because unique songs, very unique songs. Dave's got a unique voice. He's just got a whole unique approach. Uh, and then unique lineup, right? You know, you've got this, this crazy fiddle player and, it, you know, I mean. It was crazy, this, this crazy drummer. This crazy drummer. Yeah, absolutely. There are some really entertaining uh, videos of, of him be- before he broke, like playing in, in bookstores or music stores. And, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it, he's doing this exact same thing. There's nothing of that. That is how he plays. And that is how he sings. I mean, that's it. He is, he has matured his style some over, over time. I mean, fairly amount. And, and I think his songwriting has gotten better, but there were certainly, you know, first record had tons of interesting songs. Oh, yeah. We, the only one we play because we added horns to it is too much. And that is oh, really sure. fun groove. The breakdown of that is just so funky. And, and it's just, that, that, that's just really, you know, a fun song acoustically. I like, I like the slower, the ballad songs, um, but it is hard to sing over those things. I mean, I they're just like really, really hard. Yeah, no, but he's, there's he's so an much material an exercise in independence. Like Absolutely. when I started playing guitar, whatever it was, it's, eight, nine, 10 years ago. I was like, oh, I want to learn some Dave Matthews stuff. And <laughs> and at some level, it was like, oh, thank goodness. Like, I, I know how to use my hands on like bongos because this sort of makes sense on the guitar. But at the same time, it was like, okay, well, wait a minute. Then what's up with these chord shapes, Dave? Like, yeah, I, there's yeah. a cool site called dmbtabs.net. I think it's .net. I'll okay. check it. All right. And um, not only does he tab every... Dave Matthews, I think up to the last album uh, or the album before this, but he has uh, a couple of cool lessons about how Dave's approach, like all of his major chords can be in one of these two shapes, which are different than what you're used to his minor chords. And the funny thing actually for me is a lot of the, um, a lot of the chord shapes are just based upon two or three notes yet. It never sounds thin when he does it, but when I do it, you know, <laughs> yeah. you need it. Yeah. It's in the fingers, I mean, man. Right. I it mean, is it's in the like, fingers. Yeah. 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 I, I know I've always liked the band, but to answer your question, because I used to see them a bunch and would listen to their live tapes a bunch. I mean, we were, I was really into them for a long time. Um, a lot of those drum parts, even the, the nuances of them are sort of programmed into my brain. So I, I, if somebody says, oh, let's play Ants Marching, it's like, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I, I know that drum part. Yeah. I don't have to think about it. It doesn't mean that I'm going to execute it perfectly, but I at least know where we're going and what I'm supposed to try to do. But that dude's, yeah. that dude's hands are, like Carter Beaufort, his hands are really, really fast. I mean, yeah. like, that's his thing. Well, he goes through, he has a huge kit, right? And yeah. he goes through those fills that go across his kit, 
aggressively, well, powerfully, and fast. And fast. And he's a, you know, he he plays a right-handed kit for the most part. His ride symbol is above his hi-hat. But, but he uh, he says he's mostly ambidextrous, which could be, could be said of most drummers, to be fair. But he's a lefty when he plays the drums, right? He leads with his left hand on the hi-hat and the ride symbol. And, and so that allows, I, like there was one part the other night that we were watching, I think it was in Warehouse, and it was one I'd never been able to figure out. Like, it's a simple little thing, like in the breakdown groove that I just couldn't, I was like, how is he doing that? kind of little Latin feel thing? Yeah. Well, the reality is it's no different than the groove he's playing throughout the rest of the tune. He's just changing the instrumentation of it. He's using cross stick mm. instead of the snare drum or whatever. But it's because he's playing it open handed. He's not, you know, whenever I hear that groove, I'm like trying to play it with like a right handed drummer normally would with, with my right hand over the top of my left hand. And it doesn't work. And playing it left hand lead, it was like, oh, that's probably the simplest groove the guy plays all night. <laughs> but, I, you know, I kind of twist and shout, isn't it? God, yeah, that's exactly all it is. It's just it's just that straight groove. It, it Like I said, it's 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 so not him that I, I overthunk it when I when I first <laughs> tried to learn it. But um, but yeah, no, I've always liked that band. And I, I think I think where they got their bad rap was um a combination like the jam crowd, they were very much in that jam band crowd. And then when they made the switch to arenas, they changed their, their style of improvisation from being willing to like go in, you know, take things completely out of the form of the tune and just get weird. Uh, kind of like fish will at times, but in their own way, but they would definitely get weird and like lose time sometimes intentionally. And when they moved to the arena thing, they sort of tightened, they, they lost that. And I think it was intentional. And they said, okay, let's just solo inside the form of the tune and make it a party. And because we've got, you know, 20,000 people there and there's a thousand of them way, way over there that we don't want to entirely lose by doing this weird stuff here on stage. So I, I think there was some of that, some resentment of of sort of the jam crowd that that it, it helped kind of support them initially. And then was like, wait a minute, this isn't what we signed up for. And it's like, oh, well, that's fine. Somebody else signed up for it. Let's, let, let them do their thing. Dave writes good yeah, songs, yeah. I think. Yeah. I do too. Yeah. Yeah. So and, I, I, and you okay. know, it's a very interesting coalescence of musical talent. I don't know if that's what the whole Charlottesville scene is, but you know, Dave wrote good songs and had this very, has this very unique approach to playing guitar, rhythm guitar. Yep. And then you have this drummer and these jazz cats, right? Cause that's what, what, Carter and, and, and the sax player, yeah. um, you know, that's what the, they're jazz cats, right? I don't know. What yeah. was Boyd's background? Uh, Boyd was, uh, well, he, he played a lot in like symphony orchestras and that sort of thing, but also had his, you know, Boyd Tinsley band, the uh, kind of a rock band uh, that, that he had. So yeah, that was his background. If you, and you can go back and find videos of Carter. I think Carter Leroy and I don't think Boyd, but definitely Carter and Leroy on some BET shows from, you know, 25 years ago. Wow. Yeah. Carter was a school yeah, teacher. I mean, I like love those, him. I, those I really guys had careers when, when that right. band started. Yeah. Right. Dave, Dave was a bartender, right? And Dave was, I, I think that's right. I think that, I, yeah, I never dug into it that deep. Um, Dave was a weird guy. He seems like a really, he seems like a really good guy and, um, you know, he gives back a lot and, yes. and, uh, you know, he cares about his fans. They've been great at social media and, you know, monetizing everything they do merchandise, you know, they're, they're selling their shows and, and, uh, and the recordings of their shows. They're really, but I, I'd heard that they were actually doing pretty well financially before they got a major label. Oh yeah. It's, uh, it's, Just selling their say, own stuff at their shows. Dave, Dave, when I met Dave, he was kind of dark and brooding and, and shy. It was really the best way that, and, and I think he really was shy. I mean, I think that, that, that was, and he might still be for, you know, for all I know, but, um, but yeah, they sold a hundred thousand copies, I think of, of their first album that they put out on their own, that remember two things album with the, with the stereogram on the cover. Um, yeah, it's just, you know, it's like they, they basically wrote their own record deal. They had a lot yeah. of record companies coming up to them. This was in 93. Yeah. Maybe just before 94 earlier. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and they were like, yeah, why do we need you again? Like we're doing fine. And yeah. so finally RCA was the ones that said, okay, look, just fill it out. 
whatever you want. Our signature's already on it. We know we can make money off of you and you'll make way more than you are. And so they were like, well, that sounds like a good deal. <laughs> <laughs> That's deal. I'll take that. That's the deal we've been waiting for. But from a musician standpoint, they're a very fun band to get into and just kind of explore yeah. the styles. And they're yeah. not, they're not um, garage band songs. You know, they're not, you nope. know, just walking. You got to, you got to learn. You got to be able and, to play. Uh, you, yeah. You got to yeah. understand them. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I saw another band last week, though. I saw a, a cover band, all instrumental, called Jazz is Fish. Now, I think I talked about this on the show last year when I saw them the first time. It's really these two brothers, the Chase brothers out of North Carolina. Uh, the drummer, Adam, came up with this idea after Billy, that whole Billy Cobham Jazz is Dead thing, right? Where they played Grateful Dead tunes that... Uh, they did instrumental and they brought sort of a jazz, uh, you know, concept to a lot of the tunes. And and he and his brother, Matt, who's a guitar player, uh, had always been Fish fans. And uh, so they they did the same thing with Fish uh, music. And they always have different musicians with them at some level. So this year, they last year, they had Felix Pastorius playing bass, Jocko's son. And uh, I think I mentioned how much that he his playing blew me away, especially with this kind of music, because I like Fish's music, but I, I really never felt like Mike Gordon of Fish is just not my kind of bass player. Um, it, he's, I mean, he's he's great and he's fine. And obviously, I like the grand sum of what they put together. But if I were picking bandmates, he would not like his style would not be atop my list. Um but uh, but but Felix's would be so it was really I really like hearing these songs interpreted that way. And Felix is still with them on this tour. But they also had oh, and I'm going to forget his name, the guitar player from Dopapod, which is another jam band that I've never seen. And he was really stellar. So they had two guitars on stage that worked really, really well together. Two horn players. One of them was from Snarky Puppy. The other one is a guy named Carl Gearhard who actually has played with fish. I've seen him with fish a couple times. And then they had this keyboard player, this 18 year old woman prodigy from that's going, she's a Berkeley student uh, off for the summer right now. So doing some, a little bit of touring. Her name is Domi D O M I. And mm -hmm. she's from France and man, like <laughs> not since Jan Hammer have I seen hands Whoa. move that fast on a keyboard. Like, Whoa. holy cow. And a lot of the this I saw her on the first night that she'd ever played with them. They did some rehearsing together, but it was very clear. She was it, it was like perfect for me because she was set up right next to Felix. So I, you know, I could just watch the two of them all night long and I was totally happy. Uh, and there were definitely some songs that the first time she heard them was the first time we saw her play them. And she was reading charts. Uh, actually, she was reading sheet music. You know, it wasn't just charts. Some of the tunes were charts, but for the most part, she was reading sheet music that had been written out. And I mean, just stellar. Oh, I mean, she played, you know, she played all the written stuff perfectly. And and, and with feeling and comping that, I mean, I, I don't know how young she would had to have started to get to where she is at 18 years old. It's just amazing her sense of what to do inside of a tune and all of that. And when they would throw her solos, it was just like, I mean, like, like I said, it reminded me of, of Jan, a little bit of, of like, like Joe Zavinal, right? I mean, that kind of, she had a lot of that, that sort of seventies sound in, in some of the stuff that she was doing, but again, really like ridiculously fast fingers. <laughs> Uh, it was, and, it, you know, it's small club. Right. So I was I mean, I was standing right up against the stage just watching them play. And it was oh, it was it was after seeing the Dave Matthews band the night before. And Lisa and I kind of walking out saying, well, if we never see that band again, that that would be OK. You know, oh, wow. Yeah. Like I said, the just the, the kind of the it's been watered down because of the you know, because of the lineup changes. Um it, and then walking into that Jazz's Fish show, which was underattended last year, it was it sold out. This time, it was maybe half. And uh, but I mean, it was just stellar. And interestingly, they they had two sets planned last year. They had played two sets, and this year I looked at the set list after the fact. They had two planned. They skipped the set break. They blasted right through. And I think it was because the club was not full. 
you know, and they were probably like we all do. You, you make that split second decision of, yep. well, do we stick around and not let them leave or do we give them a chance to get a drink and maybe get in their cars? Like, I think everybody probably would have stuck around. I mean, the, those of us that were there were like everybody was really into it, but it was, you know, it was lightly attended. So I think they didn't want to. They didn't want to play any games with that. So they just played straight through, which was great. Sure. Yeah. But yeah, if you get a chance to see Domi, I mean, I, it, I looked a little bit up on her website. She's playing with all kinds of different people. I think she's doing five or six dates total with Jazz's Fish. And then she's got some other stuff going on. So uh, you will no doubt run into her again somewhere or just go look her up on YouTube. I'll put some links in the show notes. She's just D-O-M-I. D-O-M-I. Yeah. Yeah. This woman from France. Uh, I've got a friend who's going to Berkeley next year and I told him, I'm like, he's a keyboard player. I'm like, well, there's your competition, man. <laughs> Good luck. Have fun with that. Yeah. Yeah. Really. Yeah. So it was cool to see. Cool to see. Um, so I played that gig last week with C rock. We played down in Hampton beach on the, uh, on the band shell there. I think I talked yeah. about, I did this gig with them last year. And, uh, and two things happened. Number one, we set up this, we had a, we had hired someone to run faders for us. And, and this is just a kind of a, a warning story. He did a great job running faders, by the way, and, and sound out in the, in the house was stellar based on all the recordings and people I talked to, but, uh, he wasn't there when we set up all the gear. So we set up the gear. We did line checks. We actually even did a sound check for our monitor level on stage without him there. Got everything where it was. I was using in-ears. I think I was the only one. Everybody else was on uh, wedges. And then he got there and, you know, we, we were like, okay, here's the iPad. He knew the board. So he was like, great, no problem. And he went and mixed front of house. And all night he was messing with gains and it was just one of those things. I mean, it was just unfortunate timing that he did not get his hands on the board before we started tuning our monitor mixes. And, you know, I woke up the next day, my right ear was ringing. It was just like, cause he had just started messing with the gains, especially on, on like the guitar and the bass. And it was just, I mean, I was trying to combat it while we were playing, but obviously I've got a lot going on. So, you know, I can't, I can't ride that, that the whole time. And, it was really an unfortunate thing. And it wasn't until maybe, maybe yesterday that kind of my, the ringing in my ears subsided. So it's just one of those things. If you're using in ears, make sure whoever's running front of house understands which pieces of what mm -hmm. they ha have control over will impact you because the minor changes are much more, there's no subtle change with in ears, right? Everything. Yeah, I bailed on them. What's that? I've bailed. You completely? Um, I, it's just, it's right one out of 10 times. Oh. Little things like when our sax player comes up front to take a solo mm -hmm. or, or a horn player and he needs to be in that monitor for a few seconds can end my night, you know, can be like, you know, because it's, you know, especially Why does on a he hot need to be stage, in, your, in your ear monitor? Oh, do you have a no, wedge? No, no. In, oh, go ahead. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, so wait, is the is the wedge mix the same as your ears mix though? It has been on occasion. Oh, that's bad. You should. That, right. So that's another lesson, right? Yeah. Don't don't share. If you're going to share an ears mix, make sure it's just someone else's ears. I've done that mm. before, and that can be okay. It's not optimal, but it can be okay. But sharing with like the difference between ears and speakers is remarkable. Yes. And and you should not have anything changing for one that impacts the other. I, I'm just the two shows that I've done since that. So the night after you saw me, I did one yeah. without ears because I had such a bad experience that night. And again, if somebody else is, is mixing, it's hopeless. Mm -hmm. And even Bill, who knows what I like, you know, I still I'm stuck with the fact that as the night goes on, different things get get louder and and the desire to be very tactically in touch with the band and the audience and the isolation of the in ears. How many years I've been talking to you about this. Yeah, I know. I'm bailing on it. I'm, uh, I'm done. So you got to wear earplugs though, right? You're going to do something yeah. to protect your hearing. Okay, good. Yeah. Okay, good. Good. So, okay. As long as you're doing something to protect your hearing like that yeah. as, as both a friend and uh, the podcast host here for all of you out there, like do something because yeah. it, 
this thing that we do called playing music cannot happen or at least without ears can't happen well <laughs> without ears. Yes. Yeah, so well, just see, really you heard what happened to Huey Lewis, right? He just canceled yeah. the rest of his tour because yeah. he said he lost all low end sensation for, <sighs> for sound. So, yeah, I was pissed, you know, for about four days, um, with just with everything that was going on with my, you know, I haven't heard ringing in my ears in a long time, which mm. is a good thing. I didn't like, I didn't need to be reminded of the, the fact that it's a good thing. I already knew it, but, um, so I had another interesting experience on stage though. That aside, there were two tunes that we rehearsed the day before. Cause you know, I was, I was traveling the week before I played that gig. We played this gig last Monday. So we didn't get like the rehearsal the week of. So we got together the day before the gig, which I'd never like to do. It's non-optimal, but in this case, it was the right thing. So we got together here at the studio and played through the set. And, uh, you know, when we had gotten together, I don't know, three or four weeks ago, they had mentioned a couple of these tunes. They're like, oh, yeah, you'll sing on them. And then for whatever reason, they weren't on my prep list. So I just didn't think about it. And we got to rehearsal and it was like, oh, time, the Pink Floyd tune. Like. Oh crap. I'm singing that. Like, I don't know that song. Like no. I, uh, yeah. And they're weird That's lyrics. Cool. Yeah. And I was like, Oh crap. And the guitar player is like, Oh, but I really want to play it. You know, can we, uh, can, you know, are you sure? I'm like, well, if I can, like, I know the melody. If I can see the lyrics, sure. I'll do it. It's fine. And then the same with comfortably numb. I've never sang the Roger Waters part of that. I've always sung, uh, the harmony to the David Gilmore part. So I didn't know those either, but those are, I mean, there's a lot less of them than there is with like time where I have to sing the whole thing through. And, uh, and so with time, I, I actually taped the lyrics to my kick drum in a perfect way. Like I could see everything. It was great. So it was like, okay, fine. Yeah, we can do the tune. And, uh, and so we did, you know, we played the song, we made it through it fine. I had people, and that was the only song, the only two songs I sung all night. Um, but let me actually pause you. What is the actual thinking of someone asking someone to sub and then springing some surprises on them? So, you you know, you've you've probably done some prep, you know, you put in some time. You want to look good. You want, you want them to look good. Sure. Like, were you, were you ticked off? Uh, a, a little. I mean, I think in their mind, it wasn't a surprise. I think in, in their mind, it was like, oh, yeah, we tried this a month ago and it's fine. I Whatever happened, like right before I left, I, I said, does somebody have a set list? And nobody replied. And I looked back through an email trail and I think I, I, I think this is the one. So I put that on my on my phone and that's what I listened to and kind of thought about while I was gone. And then we got to rehearsal the day before the gig and they were like, right. So here's the final set list. I was like, oh, this is slightly different. And so these two tunes just weren't in my field of view. They probably should have been. So it's, you know, I, I would say it's as much my fault as it is anybody else's in the band that, you know, that this was not fully communicated um, ahead of time. But the interesting thing, Paul, is that we finished the gig and there were a bunch of people. We did a fling fest the previous Saturday night. There were a bunch of people at this gig that were at, at Fling Fest too, and that have seen me play before. And several of them came up to me and said, man, you know, I, I never realized what a good voice you had. Yeah. And, and so that's always nice to hear. But you know me, like, I can't ever leave anything like uncontemplated. Right. So <laughs> I started thinking about this. I'm like, well, wait a minute. Y you know, I got like a lot of compliments on my voice, which, which is great. But they were like, I sang two songs that I've literally never sung. Or maybe I'd sung them the day before, but like, these are not in my wheelhouse. And I thought, well, isn't that interesting? You know, every voice professional that I've ever spoken with says, just think about the lyrics. Don't overthink the singing, follow the lyrics and, and things will sound good. You know, like that's the way to make things sound good. And obviously that's what I was doing because I didn't know the words. So like the lyrics were the most important thing. I mean, I was, I was aware of needing to sing the melody in tune, but it wasn't top of mind. It was sort of as, as the singing pros say, the automatic part that's just going to happen. Think about the lyrics. And I was like, you know, am I, when I know the lyrics, am I over singing a little bit? Am I putting too much emphasis in my brain onto how I'm singing and, and how I'm phrasing things. Am I overdoing it? And so it's, it was just an interesting thing. I haven't had a chance to really 
you know, I haven't had any gigs since Monday, so I, I'm not sure what the magic answer is there. But it sure seemed like there was there was there's a lesson to learn. Um, and maybe maybe I do over sing some or over affect my singing some and, and need to just let it kind of happen. How do you uh, how do you naturally. define over effect? Uh, you know, too much personal injecting too much personality into it. And uh. I don't I don't think that I do that. But clearly there's there's something here and, and it's possible. I mean, it's, at times, certainly. I've so you're saying that this that. because you you ha- you knew you had to play it cautious and just get it done. Correct. You were sticking to the to the letter of the law, not the spirit of the law. You got it. And uh, yeah, I guess there's something to say there. I always found that the most the most successful singing endeavors I have are the ones where you're totally out of your head. So you don't right. have to think about the lyrics. Right. You just you can just kind of be in that moment. I mean, and, and in fact, to me, I don't, I don't think about the lyrics, like what is the next word? I really try to kind of get into the storytelling of the song and think about, you know, what, what is the story that I'm sharing? And that is what usually takes me out of focusing on, you know, what is the melody again? How am I going to do this run again? Can right. I do this run? Can I hit that note? If I'm totally out of my head on that stuff, on the, on the technical aspects of it, it seems to go better. Yeah. Well, and I mean, it's like, and this is perhaps, I don't mean to impose my preference on anyone other than me, but you know, it's the same as when I go see somebody and they sing the national anthem. It's like the the straighter you sing that, the better you sound, you know, people that like to do too many runs through it and over affect it and add too much personality. And, And so I think that's sort of the lesson I'm taking away. Not again, not that I'm aware of doing that or intentionally doing that. But I, I think at some level that comes out when it's like, well, everything else is automatic. You know, should I milk this one note a little bit or should I do that? Like there's there's a temptation to to do that when everything else is, you know, you've already taken care of it. So and again, I, I'll speak from my experience. Yeah. The need to, as you say, over effect. Is usually a contrived um, contrived yes. decision. You're covering up for something else, you know, uh, I, I would say that's actually an amateur. I, I don't get, I'm talking about myself, but no, I know right. when I catch myself wanting to put an embellishment on a run, it's often little subtle things. Like I didn't quite like the pitch of the word before I did it. So I better do something special now. So people won't you know think about that. I mean, I, I find a whole bunch of kind of like pragmatic justifications, rationalizations for doing stuff. And whenever I listen back to anything I've ever sung, the simplest is always the best. Always, 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 always the best. Always right? the best. Yes. No runs, no glisses, no, no, no gliding up to a note. Just stay on right on pitch and sing the song. And I think what's really helpful is go back. I mean, I guess it depends on who you listen to, but I know for the, a lot of the rock singers that I sing to, there's, you know, there, that stuff isn't there. They're just uh-huh. singing, right? right? It's the tonality of their voice, not not the tricks that they're doing. And again, if you're listening to Aretha Franklin and stuff like that, you know, that's all part of the vibe. But I think for most rock singers, they're just emoting. They're just they're just singing, and and yeah. I and part of it, 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 you know, you hit on it here. Part of it is I don't trust that I sound good enough without right. having to work a little bit harder to sound yes. good. Yes. So right. you do something to so, make you feel better about that, that what you, your, your perceived shortcoming. Yes, absolutely. Your, your perceived shortcoming. Agree. And and the one time that I go on stage and can't spend any time thinking about that, it's just like, I just got to get through it. I know like there's people to whom every word that I'm about to sing means something and I'm, I can see them. And so, holy crap, I better sing these words right. And I better sing them in tune. And other than that, I can't think about anything else. So I wasn't thinking about, you know, am I opening my throat enough? Am I, you know, am I supporting the note? Like none of that stuff factored in. It was, are you singing the right words and are you in tune? Those are the only things I could think about. Oh, and also playing this drum part that I don't really have in my bones. I know it, but it's not muscle memory. And those are slow tunes, right? That time is that, you know, it's a really slow thing. So I don't get to just like play a fast groove and, and ride on that. Yep. I've got to drive this slow groove and sing the thing that I don't know either part well enough to really be doing this. So, yeah, it was. A, it, so I think that's it. It's the, you know, trust that you've got more than you think you have. 
And and that, you know, that's not just vocally. I know I learned this lesson a long time ago in terms of my playing where, you know, we would do these weekly jams and record everything and then listen back. And I've talked about it here before where we would we'd go and listen and you know, you'd, you'd have these moments where you're playing. You're like, oh, this is freaking awesome. I can't wait to hear this back. And you listen back. You're like, oh, I overplayed. That wasn't good. You know, or the opposite where you're like, oh, this is kind of boring. And you listen back. You're like, wait, wasn't this the boring part? This is amazing. This is great. You know, you learn to do that. So it's it's I just need to learn to do that vocally. This is what it comes down to. So <laughs> it's interesting. Word. Yeah. The value of simplicity. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Don't overdo it. So, all right. Well, that's what I got for today. How Good about stuff. you, man? Interesting yeah. week you had. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm I'm back from vacation. I got four gigs this week. I'm looking forward to get into it. I got a couple of big house rocker gigs. We're really heading into our the meat of our summer schedule. So we've got some huge audiences to play for this week, which I'm really looking forward to. Uh, we, you know, I think I said last week, we hadn't quite gotten the rhythm of regular gigs where everything is butter yet, but that should start this week I was just, I mean, we're, just playing, we're say, playing at least twice a week for the next three months that's great oh yeah 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 you'll settle in nicely Th- this will be good for uh for your new drummer there right yeah yeah all of us for everybody true yeah yeah yeah, yeah. but by the time you get to the end of this season he won't be he'll your be new drummer anymore right? That's he'll, right he'll just be a band member yeah <laughs> that's I mean, you, right you'll be able to give him guff you know 10 years from now about him being the new guy but that's fun you know <laughs> yeah <laughs> Cool. All right. Well, that's what we got, folks. Have a good week, Dave. Thanks. You too, Paul. Everybody, always Always be performing. Thank you. (laughs) You're welcome. 